Our scripture this morning is taken from John chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. This is Jesus' first miracle. On the third day, wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Dear woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied. My time has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. So they did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. This, the first of his miraculous signs, Jesus performed at Cana in Galilee. He thus revealed his glory, and his disciples put their faith in him. Here ends the reading of his holy word. So in our scripture for today, we find Jesus performing what we believe to be his first miracle. And we believe that this is his first miracle because chronologically, when we look at the Gospels and the information that we have, this is the first time that we are given a written example of Jesus' miracle. This particular miracle, it seems very strange to us, does it not? That he performed this one at all that he changed water to wine. In our modern sensibilities, it seems very strange, and I know that there are people that take this passage to say, well, Jesus turned water into wine, so it's okay for me to drink as much wine as I want. See, many people choose to take this scripture out of context and in that way, uh, and that is not what is happening here. So let's take a look at it and break it down a little bit and see what this scripture might mean for us today. Now, when we think about the miracle at Cana, and as I thought about it this week, I came to the conclusion that there was a mistake made at this wedding. Now, we don't often hear those words put together, right? Jesus and mistake. But there was a mistake made at this wedding. Now, Jesus didn't make the mistake, but the people that were planning the wedding did not plan accordingly. If you've ever planned a wedding, you know that it can be a very stressful thing to do. So stressful, in fact, that in our modern world, we have people that their entire job is to help brides and grooms plan weddings. And part of that stress comes from planning a wedding is making sure that everything is taken care of for the reception. And one of the things that you have to plan for at the reception is to make sure there's enough food and water or whatever drinks that the people are going to have uh, for everyone that's going to be there. If you've ever been to a wedding where they ran out of food at the reception, that is not a great feeling, um, knowing that maybe you have to go to like Pizza Hut uh, for your food that day. So they ran out of wine at this wedding. Does that mean that everyone at the wedding was throwing caution to the wind and drinking heavily? Well, no, it doesn't necessarily mean that. Now, I think we can all agree that a wedding is a joyous time, and perhaps it's a time when people might overindulge in the libations at that particular time, but it's important to remember that during Jesus' time, drinking wine was often safer than drinking water. And so it was important for them to have enough wine. Indeed, in 1 Timothy, Paul writing to Timothy tells Timothy that he wishes Timothy would drink a little bit of wine. See, Timothy always abstained from wine and only drank water. And the reason being, Timothy was having such issues with his stomach and getting sick from the bacteria that was found in the water. 
So wine was safer to drink due to the fermentation process that took out the bacteria. That's why it is so important at this particular wedding to have enough wine. It's not necessarily a question of heavy drinking. It's a question of having enough to drink so that everyone has something safe to drink. So Mary comes to Jesus and says, can you help them out here? They're out of wine. And I love the response from Jesus. What does that have to do with me, woman? Can you almost hear him saying it as, Mom, how is it my fault or my responsibility that they've run out of wine at this wedding? But Jesus, perhaps remembering the command to honor your mother and father, he goes and he does turn that water to wine. And when we consider the miracle that Jesus performed at this wedding, and we stack it up against all the other miracles that Jesus performs throughout his ministry, this one seems kind of blah, doesn't it? When you consider healing the lepers, or giving sight to the blind, or helping those that have been lame their entire life to walk, changing water to wine just doesn't seem to stack up to those other ones. When you consider how he rose from the dead, the miracle of his resurrection and the miracle of his ascension, changing water into wine really pales in comparison to those things. So then why do we even keep this particular story in the Bible? What is the point of having it in the scriptures? Well, we know that scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching and rebuking, so there must be a reason that this story is recorded there. And as I considered it this week, the reason that I came to believe and the conclusion that I came to, uh, to why the story is included in the Bible is because it is the beginning of his ministry. It is the spark of his ministry. The start, the first burning ember into what will grow into his ministry. Now, one of the things that I've come to enjoy doing at the parsonage is building fires in the fireplace, not just out back, uh, but in the fireplace. I'm very thankful that when Pastor Dave was here, he asked, asked to have the wood stove put in so that I can use it now. And I've learned over the past few years how to build a fire, and I've learned primarily through trial and error. See, when I was a Cub Scout and then a Boy Scout, very briefly, but when it came to fire making, I probably wasn't paying attention that day. And if you ask my scout master, that would not have come as a surprise to them. But what I have found is even to this day, there are times when I make mistakes building that fire. See, there are times when I don't start with the right base. There are times when I throw too much wood on too quickly and I smother the flame. And there are times when things are going just fine and then I put more wood on there and I actually make it to the point where it gets too warm to be in the living room. Now you may be wondering to yourself, well, pastor, what does you building fires in the wood stove at the parsonage have to do with anything that could possibly connect to Jesus and the miracle at the wedding of Cana in our lives today? Well, just like me building a fire, just like Christ changing water into the wine, the ministry that we perform ourselves and in our lives has to start somewhere. It has a beginning, and it must begin with a small ember that begins to glow inside of us. Now, I am hopeful that each and every one of you, if you were pressed to do so today, could stand up and say, this is the moment in my life when I decided to follow Christ. This is the moment in my life when the fire was first lit. And this is what caused those embers to first glow. Just like the ministry Christ had, and just like a fire that we build, whenever that first ember begins to glow, it becomes necessary to feed that fire. It became necessary for Christ to continue his ministry and make it grow for us, and it becomes necessary for us to find the right things to feed that fire. So what should we do in order to make sure that we are feeding that fire in our own hearts? Well, we have to put the right things in. We need to make sure that we are studying God's word, that we are taking it in and consuming it and letting it grow inside of us, letting it ignite the fire and grow even larger in our hearts. We need to make sure that we are praying, 
in praying with purpose, asking God to give us the things that we need to grow spiritually. And we need to make sure that when God offers the chance for us to grow spiritually, we take them. Next week, we're going to have a presentation by the Mexico mission team. And I want you to listen for how the trip helped them light the fire in their hearts. Now, in addition to that, we need to make sure that we are facing the problems of this world that can put out our fire. Sometimes we get comfortable where we are. We get comfortable with where the fire is in our lives, how it's burning. And we start to think that we don't need to add more fuel to it. And indeed, we start to put the wrong things and they creep into our lives. And then is when issues arise and that fire then gets smaller and smaller. Anyone who's ever dealt with addiction will tell you that they come to a point in their lives where they think, I'm good. I've got this beat. It'll be okay if I just have one drink. It'll be fine. And more often than not, that is where a relapse begins. So we have to make sure that we are continuing to put the right fuel in at the right time and trust God when he tells us that it's time to add another log. So that we can grow when God needs us to. I will remind you of Ecclesiastes 3.1, which says, For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. So there is a time for us to grow in our hearts. The other things that I have noticed about a fire being built, and it's because I'm the one who tends to do it at the house, it's much easier to keep a fire going if you keep a close watch on it and you feed it at the right times. It is much harder if you let it burn out and then try to start again. See, our lives are just like that as well. We don't take care of our spiritual needs. We don't do the things that God wants us to be doing, and we don't tend the flames in our hearts. At the times when God wants us to, then we will find that the fire will almost go out. Now, I didn't say out. I didn't say snuffed out altogether. Don't mishear me here, church. I said almost out. See, once that fire is lit in our hearts, it can never fully go out. It can wane. It can grow dim, especially when we are not doing what we need to take care of it. But it will never go completely out. We might find that we have to start over again and get back to the basics so that God can build that fire back up again for us. So my question for all of you today is this, how's your fire doing? I hope it's burning bright. I hope it's spreading everywhere that you go, but if we're honest with ourselves, we might be saying, no, pastor, I'm down to the embers. I'm down to the coals and I'll be honest, they're not glowing very hot. Whether it's through what we're doing or what we've been feeding into our spiritual fire or whether it's this world and what it's been doing to us. We see the things that are happening. We find it easy for ourselves to take them in and find our coals getting colder and colder, wondering what we can do or what we should do to make them grow again. Well, brothers and sisters, if you feel that way today, know that you're not alone. So many of us are there with you right now, but we also know that once Jesus Christ has ignited that spark inside your heart, there's no way for it to go out completely. And when it feels as if it's the coldest it's ever been in your entire life, there's still something there burning and glowing. I want you to know that God wants to give you the things that you need to make it grow again. And he's waiting for you to take the steps that you need to take. Waiting for you to add that fuel in hopes that you will turn to him and ask him to reignite the fire in your heart. Recently, or I really every week, um, in order for me to have my time of worship, I like to watch other people give their sermons online. That's the way that I have found that works for me. And I watched one this week by someone actually in the Sunbury area, and one of the things he called for was a revival, a revival of the people of Sunbury. And I thought, this is a wonderful, wonderful sermon that he gave. But as I considered that as well, revival doesn't start with the people down in town. 
Revival starts right here with us. It starts with us growing the fires in our heart so that we can take it to those people in town. So if you're sitting there today and you say, I've never, heard, I've never had that fire lit inside my heart, I've never let Jesus come in, then my question for you is this. Aren't you tired of feeling like you're going at it alone? Aren't you tired of feeling like this world is all that you'll ever have? And aren't you tired of chasing down the wrong things that just leave you cold? If you find yourself in that situation today, I'd love to talk to you more about letting Jesus into your heart. And if you feel so moved today that you want to accept Jesus Christ, why not let that spark of Jesus ignite your heart today? I'd ask that you come forward during our closing song and make today the day that you take Jesus as your Savior. Because there's one thing I can promise you. Once that fire is lit, it will never go out. You'll never be alone again, and you'll never have to feel the coldness of this world again without a Savior who is waiting there to start the fire with you. Amen. My challenge for you this week is this. What do you need to get, do to get your, your fire started again or burning brighter? Do so this week.